The Small Business Show, episode 374 for Wednesday, April 6th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Small Business Show here at businessshow.co, where we are small businessing every week. Really, we're small businessing every day. We just talk about it on this show once a week. Sponsors for this episode include sky-sale.com slash rate tracker, where you can get your free eval of your credit card fees and figure out what's going on there. And bambi.com slash small, B-A-M-B-E-E, B-A-M-B-E-E, easy for me to say, dot com slash small, where you can go schedule your free HR audit. We'll talk more in depth about each of those in a moment. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. You may want to stick around just to learn about those two sponsors, because if I had those uh, resources at my disposal a long time ago, uh, I think I would have been far more successful. I would say it certainly, yeah. I mean, certainly with or the easy, uh, simplified, it would simplified yeah, success. Money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, especially Ray like Tracker, that. man. Like that one. I, yeah, I, like I. It's brilliant. My my fights with Authorized Net would have been so much easier or or at least would have happened so much sooner. I can't promise they would be easier, but you know, yeah. that's, how, that's how it is. Good. Hey, I I'm happy a- to be here. This is a, a fresh squeezed episode since we typically record a week in advance, but today we're just a day in advance. Well, that's kind of a thing. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, have you ever heard before today, have you ever heard of the term a defined benefit retirement plan? So I have heard the term, but I could not for the life of me tell you the details about it. Okay. So <laughs> we, you are not alone. I, I had not heard this term before today either, and I don't know a ton about it. But when we are doing the show, especially if we're doing a show like, like Shannon, you just said, where we're recording and effectively releasing within 24 hours, I'll go look at Google Trends and, and look for what small business items people are looking for. Uh, and then if we have an answer about it, we'll talk about it. And like far and away, the, the, one of the things that just kept coming up was this idea of a defined benefit plan. And I don't know much about it because I only heard about it this morning. But essentially what it seems to be is a pension plan that you can set up for your small business, a, a pension being you know, guaranteed payouts in retirement, essentially. Right. And the, the great part up now, you know, I don't know enough about this to even decide if it's good for me or not. I certainly can't decide whether it's good for you. It's, it's worth reaching out to your, you know, your, whoever your retirement consultant is or whatever. I have reached out to mine, but I haven't heard back yet. Um, The, the, the huge benefit to it is that you can put away a large amount of pre-tax income into one of these things, far more than appears to be the limit with like an individual 401k or a SEP or anything like that. I mean, it, you know, deductions in, in the hundreds of the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, uh, if you qualify, I mean, it, you know, with a SEP, it's like fifty six thousand dollars, and you're done, right? You, you know, right. and and your four your individual four hundred one k sort of counts against that or towards that, as do your IRA contributions, if you can still make those. Uh, depending on how much you make, there's there is a limit to when you can do that too. But yeah, this defined benefits plan allows you to really sock away some pre tax stuff. Now, I'm sure that there are. Uh, there is a flip side to that coin that there are limitations on how you take this money out being a defined benefits plan. My guess right. is, yeah. is it is Pre-tax very strict. Yeah. 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 But That's right. it it is something that certainly appears to be very interesting to many people right now, given the Google trend search. And it, it certainly, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's right for me, but it's worth investigating. I've, I've already, like I said, put a query into my, uh, my financial planner yeah. about this. Yeah. I think uh, I think even though I don't know a lot about this particular model, there are certainly uh, I, th- I think the takeaway is asking and doing your own research and then checking with your accountant yeah. about hey how uh, w- what other ways can we help 
uh, our business, our personal uh, financial situation, and our employees, right? Yeah. Because there are all kinds of different ways to do it. We've done 401ks and matching and bonuses throughout the years that have really benefited employees, but on uh, there's also a significant benefit to you personally as yep. the business owner. And then when we sold our, la- our last business that had a bunch of employees and didn't have them anymore, I asked, hey, well, okay, what do we do now? And then we started a solo 401k yeah. where there's significant, and my, my wife works for the business, and you can fund a significant amount each year before the end of the year. You have to fund their amount. Um, and then for your own portion, you have until you file your taxes, which you can, you know, if you extend out to October, um, depending on your revenue, there's a, a pretty large chunk that you can put in there as well. So these yeah. things are can be really powerful and, and they're not top of mind all the time. They're no. probably on Google trends cause it's April, <laughs> April 5th. Cause it's April 5th. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like, yeah. like, like this one article, which I'll put a link to in, uh, in our show notes at business it gives two adva- two examples of of clients. Now, this is at a place that it, that wants to administer your your defined right. benefits plan, but that's which is fine. Um, sure. But they say you know, client one self employed, three year average income of a hundred grand as you know, like Schedule C or K one, and a fifty okay. year old person. So fifty year old self employed person, hundred grand K one, you know, Schedule C income. They say a participant with with those parameters can accumulate one point two million until they reach an assumed retirement age of 62. So 12 years. This means in the first year, a maximum contribution of 80, almost $83,000 can be made to a defined benefits plan. Now that's 83,000 of a hundred thousand. Now you significant. That's a significant percentage. Yeah. yeah. That's way more than the 56,000. And, yeah. and I, I mean, assuming you can live on, you know, the, that's right. The 17 yeah. that's, that's left. The challenge I always face. Is, yeah. Like, okay. It's December and the and the accountant says, Hey, you can put away this huge chunk of cash, but you yeah. know, the caveat is you have to have the huge chunk of cash. Right. If you take that same person in their second example here, same age, fifty year old self employed person making more than two hundred sixty five thousand a year, schedule C K one, that person uh, between now and you know, so over the next twelve years can accumulate two point six million. And in the first year, a maximum contribution of 166,000 wow. can be made to the plan. So like That's these amazing. are, these are numbers I did not know were even yeah. realistic. So Especially yeah. Especially if you haven't, let's say you, you didn't do a lot of contributions yeah. when you were younger uh, and you, you're kind of, you're playing catch up. So if you're, a, you know, in your late forties or, you know, 50 and you have the ability to live and make these large, uh, uh, contributions that's as it's massive man. it's massive it's yeah no it could be huge so like again it's it's when as soon as i saw those two examples it was like okay i need to reach out and and like yeah. figure out i'm sure it, there's a i'm what's sure there's the catch? a bunch of, yeah. <laughs> of uh, requirements and oh, of course like, with our solo 401k we can't own an interest in any other company that has employees or you just can't have one right so right. you have to really kind of uh, thread the needle but man this certainly sounds like it's worth uh, investigating and, and i i don't think i i think you my financial both my accountant and my financial planner disagree with the statement you just made and so i i th- i think there is um and maybe maybe they don't. I, I okay. might be wrong on that. But moving from an individual 401k to an, a SEP, you might th- – there is a path where at least the people who advise me sure. are able to find a way to put that money away pre-tax as long as it's coming from a business without employees – it doesn't matter about your other interests. So it, yeah, and maybe the SEP is different. The, from the SEP might be that vehicle. So That's right. Different. Yeah. That, yeah, 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 yeah. To be fair. Definitely worth looking at. But it, yeah, you got to ask the people that know. Yeah, yeah, you need a guide. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's, that's one. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing I found while hunting around this week, Shannon, was a, a thing on Twitter. And I'm, I, you know, I, I follow like, small business Twitter uh, enough that uh, these things just wind up getting surfaced for me. And it was from a a person who says, I got laid off yesterday from a job I really liked for people. I really liked 
Just a reminder that you are as dis- you you are disposable as soon as they decide you are. Stop working late. Stop reading emails after hours. Stop working on weekends. A job is income to live your life, not your life. And this, I mean, they're not wrong. Like this is, but it's fascinating to see this. This I'm not sure know, about that. The flip side perspective of it is. of an employee. Because it's not how you and I think, Shannon. Let right? me rephrase this. Let me rephrase this okay. statement. Uh, sure. My, comp- my company got shut down yesterday, and I really like to work there, but my customers, remember, you're just as disposable <laughs> when your customers decide that you are, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I respect and, and empathize with this thing, and, and I always, uh, I haven't been an employee in forever, Right. Yeah, and right. so I, I, I have this bias, of course, but um, this it's just a reality of business. It now, is. Yeah. there's certainly ways to handle it where you get treated as a human and the people. And, you know, it was crushing to me when I had to let people go. Oh, but yeah, it sucks. there there is re- it is a reality of business and jobs. And I would encourage the and, and there's some it's we'll put a link in the, in the show notes to go read the thread and read the responses. There's a lot of them of like, yeah, you're right. Don't put it, do anything extra, but there's just equally as many as like, well, Hey, I'm sorry this, this happened, but you know, this is doing these extra things is often how you get ahead. And, and then a lot of other answers about, Hey, now's the time to go start your own business. Right. 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 Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was, it was just interesting to see. Cause I, I mean, I'm sure these threads are out there all the time. I don't usually see them. And and so it was interesting to get a snapshot yeah. into this because it's it's not on the surface. It's not wrong. Right. You, you no, know, no. It, it's and not your cool. business. Yeah. It's Correct. you know, you are an employee and it's important as someone who employs other people to understand that at least at some level, this is the message that your employees are seeing at least some of the time. Right. Like yeah. these conversations are out there. And so. It, you're right, though, like it, there are there are times where and it's hard for us to say this because we're not employees. But, you know, there are certainly there are times where an employee who steps up and does a little extra that counts for something, especially on the day when a you lot. need to lay someone off. Yeah. Right. You, you know, lot. of course, I, I've of been course in I've been in the position where it's like, OK, well, the business has been shrinking cash flow wise. So. Yep. Today is the day that I need to, you know, cut a an employee and and I have to make a decision about that. And unless someone has put themselves in a in a position of being the obvious one to cut, well then it's like, all right, okay, which one if I can only have, you know, one of these four or or you know, if I have to get rid of one of these three people or one of these two people or one of these four people, well, which ones do I want to be left with? You know, yeah. who do I think is going to help me pick up the slack? And right. and that, um, you know, that that does that's count. The person that's going to that's the person that worries about the business as much as you do, maybe yeah. more. That's right. And and also, you know, I, I I think the larger the company is you work for, the more common this kind of thing is. That's and fair. The less that's fair. Human it is right where yeah. you get from from some, you know. Uh, manager, you know, senior vice president's office, hey, lay off 6%. Well, we just have to go across the board and lay off 6%. And then hope, maybe it works its way down the scale. Um, but in a, in a small business, which is our focus here, um, I just don't think it, well, and I can only speak to my bias because I certainly That's have the to. problem is we're, we, yeah. we, we see yeah. this through our lens. That's right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, but uh, I've always, you know, been taught and I think it's contributed a lot to the success that I've had is to make yourself indispensable Yeah. to where you just get the, the concept of you not being there is just unfathomable for the business owner. That's right. Like, no, you know, that's a person that, that they control all this. They do all these things. They do all that. And we've talked a lot on the show about like, and just recently, uh, when you're hiring new people, just automatically getting into that framework of, Hey, what do you want your next job to be? Yeah. Right. What What do you want? Do you want to take my job? Do you want to learn this? What do you want to do? If you're having those discussions in your business with people, some of them are going to really uh, love that and they're going to, you know, embrace it and move up. Yeah. Some other people are not. And I would argue that the people that don't 
and don't change and adapt and help your business grow, those are the people that that kind of have to take or that have to they take the hit when your business contracts because believe me, it will. It's not. It, it's just no doubt about it. Things happen. It, it happens. It's how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I have I have a pretty good sense. I I believe we are headed into some kind of adjustment in our economy. I mean, we've already I think started, but I, you know, there's lots of signs that we're going to be going into a recession. Yeah. And if that happens, you're going to be thinking, well, okay, and and let's hope it doesn't happen, and let's sure. hope that your business. I was going to say, even if it does rise. happen, let's hope your business is is you yeah. know outside of of the. The prime right. target of this recession. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or of any recession. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, I, I see some real indicators and like I'm, I'm involved with a number of nonprofits and we do things to raise money and hold events. And I can just tell you it's significantly different than a year ago reaching out to people to get their involvement financially. Significantly different. Yeah. And, that, and that's a big indicator. But, you know, back to your point, it is a great thread that every employer should read just to get in that mindset of, Hey, there are people working for you that think like this and how can you, uh, or at the very least, there are people working for you who hear from people who think like this and, and when they, you know, if a better offer comes along and in today's world, that's a very realistic reality that, you know, if you are not the type of employer who takes care of your employees, you know, I, I, I enjoy being able to give my employees flexibility and not, not just flexibility with their schedule when they work for me, but also flexibility where possible in which work they do for me and how they do their work and that sort of thing. And that, you know, or so I've been told makes the job fun. It makes it easier to stay here longer, you know, and, and that, that has played out. Many people that have worked for me have worked for a decade plus and, and that's a good thing. So that when that other offer comes along, they think, wow, I really don't want to stop working for this company or this person, even if there's more money over there. Like, you know, there's going to be things that that lure people away, but you can, knowing that these conversations are happening out there, you can be proactive as an employer and, and do things that make your company a good place to work, make you a good person to work for. And I'm a terrible manager. But I can make things interesting here, and and that helps offset how bad I am as a yeah. manager. So well, yeah. and and I think that you could also it, it, let me really show my bias here. Is you know you could ask this person or these people, hey, you know if you if you had that other job offer, would you bail out and leave this small business owner? And if and, and again, my yeah. frame is small business, right. and would you bail out and leave this person hanging? Because I've had that happen to me. Many, many times, many times yeah. despite the fact that you're trying to create a, a great culture and a great place to work. Well, yeah, it happens. I, I, yeah. You know, you got to walk the walk. So it, it goes both ways. You, oh, for you sure. Often yeah. both get left in the lurch and it yeah. is, it's, that's why it's business. It's not called friendship. It's not called family. <laughs> it's business. Right. And, and you have to make tough business decisions for your personal self as an employee, as well as, you know, your employer has to do it. So, but but it's a great dialogue to have certainly. Yeah, no, it is. It's good. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's even worth having like with your employees. Like, you know, I see these threads out there. I, you know, I was, I was talking with, um, with one of my people here, uh, who was telling me this is the longest I've ever worked for one company. And I said, well, that's great. I said, yeah. what's the reason for that? And I said, well, you know, I often get bored. Okay, great. Now we've identified what the leading problem is. There might, you know, they're like, or the leading, the leading reason. I don't want to say problem. Yeah. The leading reason is it's like, okay, great. Uh, if you ever get bored here, let me know. That's my fault. I'm going to help you fix it. You know, and, uh, and and they said, well, actually, the way this job is organized, it's kind of it's kind of my fault if I get bored because I do have the op- option to do different things and in different ways. And I said, well, that's great. That means that I am doing my job. But if you ever find yourself bored, that's my fault again. You know, come to me. Don't assume that you've just exhausted all of your resources to keep yourself from being bored here. Let me know. Give me the opportunity nice. to help tweak things. Right. And so. Like that, that was an amazing conversation to have. It was almost accidental 
but uh, but it was a great one. It was like, okay, whoa, good. You know, we we potentially headed off that reason for someone just leaving by yeah, surprise. That's cool. it's, it's good. It's it's smart. It's transparent. We're going to do a show about transparency. There you go. In the coming weeks. Yeah. And, uh, Next week, I think. I'll, I'll lean. Yeah, I think so. And you know, we can lean back into this because having those kinds of conversations can be really powerful because many of your employees are they, they don't uh, they're not they don't have the frame that you think that way. Right. right. They're, they're yeah. You have to say most, it out loud. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of many employees just think you're only focused on your own self-interest and uh, you know, it, it just, it's just the employee employer relationship when right. you sign their check, it, it changes things. So uh, it does uh, change that's, things. That's yeah. Good conversation to have. All right. Well, I saw uh, three movies at South by Southwest, the conference that happened in Austin last month that, uh, we're very much related to small business. And so I want to talk about uh, each of them. Really, there's there's one main conversation to have and then two sort of sub conversations. So I want to do that. The next thing that I would like to do, though, Shannon, is I want to tell everybody about our two sponsors, if that's OK for you. Yeah, let's do it, Dave. All right. Well, we talk about this on the show all the time. Payment processing is confusing as it is, and so are all the rates and fees associated with accepting credit cards as payments. You know, you are you, are you paying extra because somebody's using a rewards card, and how is that affecting you? And I think all of that stuff is super obscured intentionally in many cases. What if there was a free solution that allowed you to easily and automatically understand your bottom line credit card processing rates and fees every month? Well, our sponsor, Rate Tracker, presented by SkySale Solutions, is that free and simple way for you as a small business owner to know your cost to accept payments so you don't get lied to or taken advantage of by your payment processor. And we all know that there are payment processors out there who are happy to lie to you and take advantage of you. And that's why Rate Tracker, presented by SkySale Solutions, is here. Rate Tracker makes it super simple for you to understand your costs, to accept payments, and provides you with free access to trusted payment experts like SkySale Solutions that can give you free advice on how to optimize your payment acceptance program. So you're going to visit sky-sale.com slash rate tracker to sign up. For the only service that's dedicated to helping you know your numbers, keep track of your payment processing costs, and alert you immediately if there's ever a rate increase. Go check it out. It's sky-sale.com slash rate tracker. You can also click on the show notes link at businessshow.co. And our thanks to Rate Tracker, presented by SkySale Solutions, for sponsoring this episode. All right, so we're out there, small businessing, doing our thing, but who's running your HR? If the answer is, I'll figure it out myself, or no one, well, remember that one employee complaint can turn your world upside down in terms of your business, and perhaps even further than that, right? Bambi, our sponsor here, is an HR platform built for businesses like ours and like yours, so you can automate the most important HR practices and Get your own dedicated HR manager. First, Bambi's HR Autopilot automates all your core policies, your workplace training, your employee feedback, and then your dedicated HR manager will help you navigate the more complex parts of HR and guide you to compliance. And those people are available. That person is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. Listen, you know, an in-house HR manager can cost up to 80 grand a year. But here's the thing with Bambi, my favorite part about Bambi. I, I don't know. There's a lot of things I love about Bambi. The way they do it, the autopilot, the fact that you have a dedicated HR manager. I'm burying the lead here because one of my favorite parts is that with Bambi, your dedicated HR manager starts at just $99 a month. You heard that, right? There's no extra zeros. $99 a month. No hidden fees. Cancel any time. You're going to love this. You run your business. Let Bambi run your HR. Go to Bambi.com slash small right now for your free HR audit. Spelled B-A-M-B-E-E dot com slash small. That's Bambi.com slash small. And our thanks to Bambi for sponsoring this episode. All right. So 
The first movie, what do you got? the first movie that I saw at South by Southwest. These are movies about crazy people, but that's what we I love. Like those movies, yeah, yeah like exactly. Them. It was a movie called Second Chance. Uh, it, uh, hopefully, it comes out. You know, all these movies that I get to see it at South by Southwest are are generally premieres or pre release movies. They might have premiered at Sundance or a different film festival, okay. but um, but you know, they they are not yet just out for anyone to see in the theaters. The good news is that unlike ten years ago. Now we have all these streaming services that are vying for content. So there's a lot more avenues for these movies to be able to reach people and more, more and more of them actually do. So this movie is called Second Chance. The, the title is 2ND uh, as the first word and then chance as the second word. And it's about Richard Davis, who in the late 60s, uh, he had run several businesses, including a uh, a pizzeria where he ran into like he and th this story gets it's morphed and and changed over the years. So no one's really sure if it's ha what the what the truth is, but it's fine. He was in a scenario where he uh, he was accosted outside of this pizzeria or something that, that he owned and uh, and he wound up having to, uh, you know, pull a gun on on one of these people and then one of them shot him and like it was this whole thing from that his pizzeria bankrupt he invented the modern day bulletproof vest and oh, yes fascinating. fascinating right and and he i mean there were bulletproof vests before that but they were too bulky to actually wear like under your clothes or anything and he figured out how to do this with you know special types of nylon that were available and stitching them all together and to prove that it worked he shot himself at a police demo for these things and then proceeded like he would shoot himself and then spin around and like shoot two bottles off of a, you know, off of a, uh, you know, a, a stand or something like that to show that not only could he take a shot, but then he could react. He wasn't just like paralyzed and, and stunned. Yeah. It, you know, he could go and and like take out the perps was was sort of the thing that, wow. that was the, the demo he would do. Uh, in the description for the movie, it says he, he shot himself 192 times. I think it's well over 200. Wow. I think it's like at 250. Yeah, right. The heck of a product demo. Right, right. Uh, as soon as he, like, they were all questionable. I I don't think it was his plan at the first one to shoot himself, but he was realizing that he was losing these people and he needed them to believe that this was actually going to make a difference in their lives and their work, uh, which are, you know... <laughs> <laughs> uh, completely related when it comes to being shot at work. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so he has, they started keeping track of how many people were shot, you know, and, and, and survived because they had these vests on. And it was like, I think the book is up to over like 3000 or something like that. Um, wow. And, and, and so this movie's fascinating because it, it talks about that, the genesis of this business. And then it talks about the evolution of the business and new things that they tried that did and didn't work for them. And, you know, like any other story about a business, <laughs> there's an arc here <laughs> and sure. uh, I won't, I won't entirely ruin the movie, but yeah, he's a crazy person. Um, I couldn't decide at the end of the movie if he was a good person or a bad person, to be perfectly honest. He obviously created a very helpful thing. Like, there's zero question about that. But, um, it, you know, some of the some of the decisions that he made through the process were, um, you know, questionable <laughs> at times. But a fa but that made for a fascinating movie. I highly, highly recommend uh, take keeping an eye out for it. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing. Shot himself. Yeah, crazy. That's really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, it. Is this, I'm looking at it. Uh, life. Richard Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Showtime has bought it. Oh, great. Uh, okay, well there you go. Documentary rights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Well then, that's yeah, that's that's right. You're right. Yeah, they've got. Uh, that's right. Yeah, so. he looks like a nut. <laughs> yeah, but you know we need we need <laughs> that, yeah you need crazy people to to get yeah. things done. Like that's just how it it is. It, you yeah, you know it, it, yes. it it's not gonna it, rarely. First of all, rarely does anyone choose to act in a way that they themselves see as irrational. Okay, and then right. also rarely are there 
you know, evolutions or revol evolutionary or revolutionary products or services introduced by someone who thinks the same way as everybody else. Right. right. Or so, by committee. Or, <laughs> it doesn't or work, it doesn't work as well. No, rarely. That's even less common, I would say. Yeah. 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 Right. So it takes somebody that just believes in, yeah, this thing's going to work. I, I I got this. Let me go. Right. And and that's something we talk about on the show all the time is that mentality is super valuable and also a huge liability when it comes time to delegate because you're like, no, I can do it myself. It's like, well, eh, maybe, but probably not as well. So, yeah. yeah. Speaking of crazy people, the second and all, in fact, all three of these are story about stories about crazy entrepreneurs. Uh, the second one is called Mickey, the story of a mouse, which is uh, about the history of Disney, but really told while sort of chronicling or by chronicling the evolution of Mickey Mouse and, and the identity of Mickey Mouse over the years throughout, um, you know, throughout the history of the company, which also then sort of is a, a bit of a mirror of, of, you know, society at each of those times, because there's there were things that Mickey Mouse used to do that couldn't, you know, Mickey Mouse can't do now. And the 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 way they sort of stitched this arc together is the three current animators that draw and are responsible for the the likeness of Mickey Mouse were creating a one minute short about Mickey Mouse throughout the years uh, that I think they call Mickey in a minute. And towards the end of the movie, you actually get to see that short. Um, and it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was very well done. The whole movie was well done. The short was also well done. And what was great was at least one, if not all three of those animators were actually in the theater during the, cause it was the world premiere that I, I wound up getting to see down at in Austin. And so, it, you know, it was nice to, to sort of recognize them for their, uh, you know, for the hard work that they put in to, to hand drawing, this, uh, you know, this one minute short, which was pretty cool, but it was a, a, you know, an interesting movie and, and was as much about Walt as it was about, you know, Mickey and Disney and the society and society, not the society, but so society. They, they do the development along the timeline of kind of what's, what was going on at that time. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah they, 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 so, yes. And, and you see the evolution of Mickey in this short that's there. Uh, so yeah, it's fascinating stuff. I really, that's cool. yeah, really an interesting. Um, Looks like it's coming out on Disney Plus. It will be out on Disney Plus. Yeah, this one you'll definitely be able to see, which is fascinating that Disney Plus, you know, that Disney themselves, well, they were, in, you know, intimately involved in in the creation of the movie, but but they were able to tell the story. There, it didn't as a viewer, it did not feel like it was a corporate message flick if, that, if that's a good way to say it right it was very much an honest documentary about this and it didn't always paint disney in the best light but you know yeah. it was cert certainly heartwarming uh and and all of that which, which you know sort of makes sense i mean it's mickey mouse yeah sure sure yeah, exactly that's great interesting the third movie shannon perhaps the craziest person of all was um it's called the pez outlaw p-e-z Right. The like the Pez dispensers that we know about. Right. Um, this is about this crazy guy named Steve Glue. He lived in Michigan, uh, lives still alive, uh, lives in Michigan. And he was this all happened maybe 20 plus years ago. OK, he was um, he, he lived on a he lived a meager existence for him and his family. Okay. He, he was a machinist and, and he, you know, hated the job, but did it every day because that's how he knew how to, how to provide for his family. It also turns out that he's massively OCD. Like uh. it, it, it's, and he'll, he'll, you know, he identifies this way. And he even said early in the movie, you know, when they were interviewing him, he's like, yeah, I keep this paper towel in my left hand all the time. Cause that sort of helps me function. It's like, wow. Okay. So like, that's a, pretty significant manifestation yes. as far as my non-professional opinion goes of OCD. Well, it, you know, part of this, you know, he wears three pairs of socks all the time, like that, that kind of thing. But he's always been a schemer and a collector. And so he started by collecting cereal boxes simply because he liked them. And 
then, okay. you know, because because you can go yeah. to the store and there's like, you know, of Captain Crunch, there might be four different variations on the box. And he loved those Got variations. It. Right. So he would collect these in some of the boxes he would keep intact, but most of them he would just cut out like the front of it or whatever and then file it away. And he, you know, OCD massively, you know, created this huge library of all these things. But what that meant was certainly back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, he had all these coupons to send away for the little toys and trinkets that would come in the cereal boxes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So he would send away for these and get piles of them. And then he realized, he said, wait, you know, these things are, themselves are collector's items. He didn't much care about them. But the only way to get a lot of these toys and trinkets was by sending away from the cereal box. So there was no way if you wanted one of these things, especially one that had already sort of gone through its production and its release, there was no way to, to buy them in the store or, you know, there was no online to buy them from back then. And so there would be these toy conventions that would happen. And he started going to these and selling his toys that he was oh. getting from the cereal boxes and making, you know, a huge profit <laughs> on this. And this was a great way for him to, you know, enhance his family's uh, income and, a, you know, financial picture. Sure. You know, if you've ever looked in recent years at those cereal boxes, they say limit one per household. You know, it says that on there. Yeah. 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 That's Steve Glue's fault. They cracked down ah. on him. Yeah. <laughs> but that killed this, this, you know, the side hustle that he had doing this. Right. So he went to the, what would hit, what he thought would be the final of these toy shows. Cause he had some inventory left over. He figured, well, I might as well, you know, sell this and turn it into cash before I can't get any more. And he noticed people were freaked out over the Pez dispensers, people paying 25, $30 for a Pez dispenser. And so he started digging in and asking the people, you know, that were, that were selling this stuff, how, like what the deal was. And, and he's, he's, he looks like a crazy person, he's big, long beard, obviously he has his, you know, three pairs of socks and his, his, um, t you know, tissue in his, or his paper towel in his left hand. And, but he, he definitely has a charm to him. He, he is very charismatic and they were willing to talk to him. These people that were, you know, making bank on these Pez dispensers. And they said, right. Oh yeah. Well, if you really want to do it, go to, go to Austria because back then, I don't know how it is now, but back then Pez worldwide was based in Austria. Pez USA, however, had, it, it was a subsidiary of them, but had a stranglehold on the U S market, meaning the, the president president of, Pe of Pez USA decided which which Pez dispensers could be sold in the U.S. And he would only sell the ones that he liked, which meant 10 uh. percent of the Pez dispensers that were made were available here in the U.S. So this created this demand for the other 90 percent that you couldn't get here yeah. in the U.S. And again, pre-Internet, there was no way. So this guy had never really even left his you know home state flies to Austria with like a map. I mean, again, like this is all super yeah. crazy and somehow finds the Pez factory and befriends the, the, all the designers there and everything. And on this first trip, he went with his son. They give him a, they gave his son, you know, one of like five of a, a pre-production run of something that was never going to be made. It was like a, a prototype, not a pre-production prototype. You know, they gave him okay. one, like you should have one of these or whatever. And then, but also he came back with literally duffel bags full of Pez dispensers that he was paying like 30 cents each for. And then he gets to customs and customs, you know, he's this crazy guy. I love those guys. He, he acts a little crazy and he's yeah. got duffel bags full of Pez dispensers and they're like, all right, come into this other room. Yeah. Now there's an interesting thing about the law, Shannon. I love little nuances like this. You can have a trademark on something and Pez USA did have a trademark on this. Um, but having a trademark doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean that you have registered that trademark with customs as being the only person or the only entity company allowed to import these things. Right. And so customs right. okay. gets this guy customs, you know, knows how all this works. They get this guy in a room, they look up Pez in their big book, whatever it is. And they realize 
Pez USA has not registered the trademark with customs. Good for him. Yeah. And, and they said, you know what? If they're going to be stupid enough not to do this, we're letting him in. And so they let him in. And the things that he bought for 30 cents each, you know, he was selling for upwards of $300 wow, each. that's awesome. I yeah, love it. His son sold the, he wasn't planning on selling the prototype, but somebody offered him like, you know, 1500 or two grand or something for it. And he was like, I mean, this, this is life changing money. So the guy started making millions, uh, uh, you know, on this because, yeah. you know, he would go back and forth. It's for him. But Pez USA Great. did not like what he of was doing. Of course they don't like it. No. Sure. And it it became this stupid, like vindictive battle that the the president, as they kept calling him in the movie, the president of Pez USA, was, you know, like really just looking to crush this guy as opposed to just, well, just register the trademark and, you know, all this goes away. <laughs> like, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was, it became this ridiculous you know, game of like cat and mouse and this battle that that went on for quite some time. And I, I won't ruin the the end of the story about how it how it sort of plays out. But it it's a fascinating business story. And again, you know, just one of these we talk it on this show all the time about how the riches are in the niches. And, you know, they are. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> well, And it's it's being able it's also uh, having that it's kind of a problem solving mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That we did a whole episode on recently. It's thinking I could take advantage of this discrepancy or the, you know, here, what is the opportunity? What's the opportunity to, yeah. to fill this need and how can I do it? And, um, you know, we, we, a lot of it is being in the right place at the right time, but also taking the initiative there. The majority of people will talk about it. Yes. A long time, their whole life over a beer, or sitting on the couch. Oh, I could have done this or, you know, that kind of thing. But it's act, it's the action That's it. that you take that makes all the difference. And if you're in the business of battling the, these larger companies over trademark and copyright, you really need to uh, get familiar with the thing, at least in the United States, called the doctrine of first sale. And it, w it can save you because you're talking to somebody who's been uh, far too intimately involved in customs uh, and getting things from various parts of the world into okay. the U.S. And the doctrine of first sale is your friend and can help you tremendously because once you own the product, there are limits to what the manufacturer or whoever can force you to do or not do with it. Once you've been uh, that, able to bring it in and sell it the first time. Well, even getting it in, you can, there are ways to, to uh, Interesting. at least open the dialogue with, um, using the doctor for sale to where you can have it. And I mean, you know, legally like you can't bring a Rolex watch in the U S you can't, you can't bring them in. Right. Um, that's why people hire other people to fly to Hong Kong and wear, you know, a very expensive watch back to the U S so they can get it and sell it. Um, so there's, and, and I can't stand that kind of restraint of trade and this, yeah. this boat mentality that, Hey, I, I own these things. I bought them legally. Um, you know, I, yeah, why can't you resell them? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, uh, and maybe if I was in the position, I would use these same tools to try to keep control of my market. Of course. Uh, Bose, <laughs> you know, maybe, right? I'm trying to think of my own biases here. Yeah. But Bose is the same way. I mean, uh, we, you know, you, <laughs> I can tell you stories about trying to sell audio equipment from Bose that would just, you know, blow your mind about the hubris and audacity of wow. the things that they would do. And if you're a small company... It's tough when you don't have the resources to fight, and that's and they know that, and that's what they do. So, doctrine of first sale. Look it up. You, uh, I, yeah. Now I put I put a link in the show notes to the uh, yeah the Wikipedia article about first sale doctrine. So yeah, you mentioned Bose and their hubris. Uh, <laughs> they, well, amongst the audio files, there is a phrase that that is tossed around all the time: no highs, no lows, must be Bose. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bose came out maybe, I don't know, let's say somewhere between, you know, somewhere in the last decade, but probably closer to a decade than, you know, than certainly not in recent years. They came out with their smart speaker line, and I can't remember the name of it, uh, you know. And so yeah. I was big, you know, and still am very bullish on on the idea of getting smart speakers or Wi-Fi enabled speakers. I like guess smart speaker has taken on a new term that that implies now that it has a. 
uh, voice assistant in it. Back then, none of the speakers that we called smart speakers had voice assistants. They were just Wi-Fi enabled. You could control them with your phones. Thing, Sonos was, you know, sort of the yeah. the first player in that market. And I got really into Sonos because of that. It really made a huge difference, you know, in, in my ability to consume music out loud, consume digital music, especially out loud. It, you know, it had kind of been stuck in all of our headphones for so long. And yeah, then great. Sonos came out and it was like, look, we, we, we've been doing this for a while. You should pay attention. And finally I did. And it was like, oh, it's amazing. And so our listeners to, you know, the Mac Geek Cab loved it. And uh, we were bullish on it, but it wasn't, I mean, I like what Sonos has done. I think they've done a fantastic job with it, but it wasn't so much that I was, you know, all in on just Sonos. I was in on the concept and they were really the only game in town initially to do this. And so when Bose came out, with their line, I'm like, oh man, I'm all over this. And I, you know, reached out to them and finally got in touch with their PR people. I had a meeting scheduled. They, they're only maybe an hour South of me here. They're, you know, just outside of Boston. And (laughs) the day before I was supposed to go to this meeting, they emailed me and canceled. And they even told me the reason that they were canceling. They're like, oh, we realize that you cover Sonos in your podcast. So we're not going to be able to meet with you. And it was like, but it wasn't, I don't think it was the competition of like the fact that I had mentioned Sonos before. It was that they realized I was well versed in how Sonos worked and how well it worked. And they knew that if they showed me this, I would see shortcomings. So of course I I went out and I just got one of these speakers. I didn't have to go see them to get one. And it was like, oh, this thing's a disaster. I mean, it was terrible. It it just seemed odd to me that that, you know, a company would have that much hubris to use your term, but it is an accurate term to say, well, instead of making it better, we'll just only let people talk about it who have never experienced anything that is better. And it's such a weird way to proceed. Like, it was just so bizarre. You know, I had a lot of people including other journalists that were like, oh my gosh, this, you know, this Bose, whatever, the sound source or sound, whatever is amazing. I'm like, like, yeah, I got, yeah. Okay. Like compared to nothing, I totally agree. Have you compared it to Sonos? No, I, I, I never really got into that. I don't really know that. Well, yeah. okay, cool. Great. Sounds good. But yeah. Great stories. I, I yeah. love, uh, you know, and I've done that kind of thing many, many times in my life. And, and I focus on, you know, focusing on the Delta between what you can get it for and how you can get it and all that stuff. It's, those are great entrepreneurial stories, uh, that, you know, I I love to hear. So thanks for sharing those with us today. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it was, it was fun. I love, and you know, that's one of the things I love about South by Southwest is the serendipity of it all. Right. Because it, I've, I've joked that I think the people at South by created that whole conference for me uh, because it is, it is, I mean, it's four conferences slash festivals that happen at the same time, really three. There's the educational one that sort of happens first and then wraps up. Uh, But then there is the interactive, AKA the tech one, the film festival and the music festival. And all three of those really apply to me, you know, as a as a human. And therefore, they apply to the various things that I produce, you know, in terms of these podcasts and the, all the content that I do. And but the serendipity of just being there and going to see a cre- a movie, you know, about, the, the, OK, this bulletproof vest guy and then realizing halfway through, oh, my goodness, like this is a great small business story. Like, you know, yeah. but you don't I don't know going in like I don't select these things and say, okay, I know why I'm going and where I might talk about this. I, I just follow my interests and invariably they wind up, you know, falling into the the buckets that, uh, that work for me. So it's, yeah, it's a great, it really is a great conference. And I'm super stoked that I was able to go in person uh, again because yeah, I had, you know, deal. I missed that for two years and it makes a difference. Yeah. So cool. All right. Good stuff. So, you know, uh, we've got a good grab bag today. If you have some more information you'd like to share with us and our listeners about defined benefit plans, and if you'd like to comment about the uh, that t- tweet thread that we uh, yeah. put in, come come see us on the Small Business Show uh, support group at 
businessshow.co slash Facebook. Businessshow.co. Yeah, or feedback at businessshow.co if you've got stuff to say. Yeah. Thanks so much for hanging out with us for uh, this week. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you subscribing. And we appreciate you visiting our sponsors. Again, you know, visit Rate Tracker at sky-sale.com slash rate tracker. Visit bambi.com slash small. And visit businessshow.co. We'll see you there. Keep living that charmed life. See you next week.